In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord in the courts of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy elders of the elders of seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from James, the fifth chapter. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes 
and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. the gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, 
Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus, amen. Dear saints of God, I think this morning we might be best served to walk through this gospel reading uh, a little bit slowly and take a look at a few of the things that Jesus is getting after, and then we want to come back and try to understand what this business is of cutting off hands and feet. We'll remember the context. Mark chapter 9, Jesus was traveling through Galilee to Capernaum. He had taught them, and this should be the shadow that overcasts the whole chapter, Jesus had taught them at the beginning of the chapter that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer and to die and on the third day to be raised. But they didn't understand what he was talking about, and instead they are arguing about who's the greatest. (laughs) Remember? So they come into the house in Capernaum, and Jesus says, what were you guys talking about? And they're too embarrassed to say anything, and So he puts a child in the midst of them and says that the one who would be the greatest must become as the least. And anyone who receives a little child like this in my name receives me. No, not me, but the one who sent me. Now this seems to spark something in John's mind, and this is where our gospel text begins. Jesus said, if you receive the child in my name, you receive me. And and John says, oh yeah, there was a guy who in your name was casting out demons, but he wasn't one of us, and we tried to stop him, but we couldn't do it. It's not a question. John is just telling Jesus, but he's expecting an answer. I think he's expecting Jesus to say, well, go try harder. You better make sure that guy stops, but Jesus doesn't. And this sets up the whole picture, the whole question that Jesus is getting after. Where should the fighting be? Where should the argument be? Where should we be upset? Jesus says, don't get mad at him, that Christian who's not a disciple, who's out there rescuing people from demons in the name of Jesus. Don't be upset with him. No one can quickly use my name to cast out demons and then turn around and speak evil of me. He's not the the problem, guys. The one who's not against us is for us. Jesus, in fact, goes on to say, verse 41, truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, in other words, who serves you in the name of Jesus will by no means lose his reward. In other words, all that's done in the name of Jesus, all that's done in the truth of the Scriptures is good. From the casting out of the demons to the giving a little cup of water. But if you want to find someone to be upset with, If you want to find someone to go and stop what they're doing, Jesus says, this is what you got to look out for. Look at verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. There's some interesting vocabulary in this particular verse that I think is helpful for us. The words for little ones here is the Greek word mikron, where we get micro, microscopic, the little ones. But Jesus says, these are the little ones who believe in me. Jesus always loves to talk about how the babies have faith and trust in him. Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, that's one word in the Greek, and that's the word scandalon, the word where we get scandal from. It normally means a stumbling stone, so like, you know, if you have a pavement made out of brick or stone and one of the bricks gets kind of pushed up like this so you always trip over it or you, or you stub your toe on it or something like that, that's the basic idea. But here I think it means something more specific. The, the, the scandal on can also be the trip wire, uh, the, 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 the baited stick that causes the pit, to the trap to fall. I, maybe think of it like the... Uh, like that little piece on a mouse trap where you put the cheese. <laughs> and when the mouse hits that little trigger, the, the thing snaps and it kills them. That's the scandal on of the children. It's the one who causes the little children who Jesus loves and desires to, believe, to, to quit believing in them, who kills their faith. It, it, Jesus is saying, if you want to find someone to look out for, someone to fuss against, don't look for the guy who's casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Look for the ones who's causing the children to stop believing. It would be better for him 
if a, look at what it says there, a great millstone were hung around his neck. That's another curious word. The millstone, remember, I, I don't know if we know, mill, the millstone was a stone, like a round stone. You'd have these two stones together, and the top stone would have like a funnel in it, and you would put the grain into the millstone, and you'd turn the millstone, and the grain would go down, and it would get ground up between the two stones, and it would become flour. And there's two kinds of mills, at least for the Greek words, there was two kinds of mills. There's the one that you can turn with your hand. You can walk around and turn. That was a smaller millstone. But then they had the donkey millstone, the one that was so big that people couldn't turn it. You had to, you had to latch a donkey onto it and drive the donkey around to press it around. And that's the word that Jesus uses here. That's why it says a great millstone, a donkey stone. It would be better for that one who causes the little ones to stumble. It would be better for him that he had a huge big rock tied around his neck and he were thrown into the depths of the sea. That's who you should fuss after. And Jesus goes on. Because the trouble that we find with sin and with affliction and with scandalizing, scandalizo, is not only out there It's also with us. If your hand scandalizes you, says Jesus in verse 43, cut it off. For it's better to enter life crippled than with two hands go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. Now you get bonus points, by the way, If as we were reading the gospel text and you were reading along, you noticed that we skipped some verses, that the text itself skips from verses 43 to 45, and then from 45 to 47. Uh, You win a prize if you notice that. Tell me after church. I'll get it for you. We'll find something in the office. Just grab a book or something. The reason why those verses are missing is because uh, in some ancient texts, there's an addition that's there, and it's not, I'm not 100% sure if it if it's should be there or not. I couldn't quite figure it out. But if you, read your, if you go home and you read your King James Bible, it'll have verse 44 and it'll have verse 46, and they, those verses are the exact same as verse 48, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The, the, the manuscripts differ here if Jesus said that after each warning or after all three. Either way, it's pretty intimidating. Jesus is saying that you not only find cause for sin out there, but you find cause to sin right here in yourself. And that we cannot treat that lightly that we cannot treat that indifferently, that we cannot act as if it did not matter what we do, what we say, what we see, where we go. We have sinful hands, sinful feet, and sinful eyes. Let us pray. O Lord, we pray for your son, Ray, that you would visit him and keep him and uphold him with your care. In the name of Jesus, amen. Jesus does not want the disciples to think that the cause of sin is even this far away from them. In other words, we might be able to say, well, I sinned, but it was my hand that caused me to do it. Or I sinned, but it was my foot that caused me to do it. Or I sinned, but it was my eye that caused me to do it. Jesus says, no, that won't even work. Because if it was your hand, then cut it off. If it was your eye, then poke it out. If it was your foot, then chop it off and throw it away to be saved. 
But even this is not enough. There's a reason and there's a way, and we should pay very close attention to this. There's a way that Jesus points out the things that we have in pairs. And there's a reason because we know that if we cut off our hand, we would still have another one to sin with. If we cut off our foot, we would use our other one to hop to trouble. (laughs) If we poked out our eyes, our eye, we would still have another one to get up to mischief with. And this is the point. We think that Jesus is teaching us how to treat our sin harshly, but in fact, if it were that easy, if it were just a matter of removing from ourselves the limbs that cause us trouble, if it were that easy, then all of us could enter into heaven ourselves by our own efforts, but it's not. It's not your hand that causes you to sin. It's not your foot. It's not your eye. It's your heart. The heart is wicked above all things. Exceedingly wicked. Who can know it? Says the prophet Jeremiah. And we don't sin because we have sinful hands and feet and eyes. We sin because we have a sinful heart. And we need a new one. It reminds me, it reminds me of Adam and Eve in the garden. Do you remember how they were with their fig leaves and the Lord comes and rebukes them and promises the gospel and then he takes an animal and he kills the animal and he wraps the, he wraps the, 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 the hide of the animal around their flesh and how Adam and Eve must have looked with horror at this, at this bloody flesh to say, is this what it takes to cover our sin? Is this what it takes to cover our nakedness and our shame? And the Lord says, just wait. It's even worse. Because it's not the the death of the bulls and the goats and the animals, but the very death of the Son of God. I think this is what Jesus is talking about with the whole salt business. Salt is good, he says, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself. There's a a, a very strange instruction that Moses gave to the priests in Leviticus, and it was that every sacrifice should be salted. The lamb before it was burned and the bull before it was burned would have salt rubbed over them. And the question is why? Salt in the ancient world was used as a preservative. It was used to store meat. They didn't have refrigerators and freezers and all that sort of stuff. So you would salt the meat if you wanted to last, but you would never salt the meat right before you put it on the sacrifice. It didn't need it. So why? Why would they have the salt for the sacrifice? My best guess is that the Lord wanted to show that this sacrifice is the sacrifice that preserves us. That keeps us. That brings us through death to life eternal. This salt is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which keeps us through sin and trouble and brings us to life everlasting. This is what it means to have salt in ourselves. Because it is not possible to escape sin by cutting off our hands. But rather, we find perfection in the hands that were nailed to the cross. It's not a matter of cutting off our own feet, but of looking to the feet that bled and died for us on the cross. It's not a matter of tearing out our eyes, but looking to the face of Him who looks on sinners like you and me, And instead of seeing us with wrath, sees us with pity and mercy and kindness and love. In Christ and in Christ alone are we preserved from death to life eternal. And you have this salt in yourself. Jesus is pointing out to the disciples that he will die and rise again to bring us to life eternal. And with that confidence and with that peace, we live and we die. In the name of Jesus, amen.
and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may stand or kneel for prayer. O Lord, be with us in life and in death, in peace and in trouble, in light and in dark, in sickness and in being well, that we would rejoice at all times in your presence and in your promises. Grant to us by your word of life to rejoice in the forgiveness of all of our sins. Keep us in Jesus' name that we would delight in your gifts, that we would find joy uh, in your promises, that we would be wise and courageous to face the days that you set before us. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, grant us to have salt in ourselves and to be at peace with one another. Give to our congregation and to all congregations in your church a joy in your word and in being the citizens of your kingdom. We pray, O Lord, that you would grant wisdom and courage to all who are elected and appointed to uh, to rule in our congregation, especially our council, David, Jim, Mike, and Karen, our elders, Troy, Greg, Jeff, Robert, Richard, Evan, Paul, Gary, Joshua, Patrick, Tommy, Aaron, and Dale, our Board of Finance, Roland, Ryan, Doug, Greg, Dennis, Peter, James, and our trustees, Stan, Gary, Daniel, Michael, Mac, Tim. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, O Lord, for the sick and for the suffering, that you would visit them according to your kindness. We thank you, O Lord, that you've set before us this day the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that all who come to this, your altar, would come with repentant joy and peace. Lord, in your mercy. For these things, O Lord, and for all other things you would have us ask, grant to us, not for your own sake, for our own sake, but for the sake and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who suffered all, to call us your children. For we ask all these things through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.